The question I get asked more than any other is what do you use for lighting your nightscape images? So today I want to go through some of my favourite setups and I'll demonstrate using the lights I use and I take with me on every shoot. There are a number of methods used when lighting for nightscapes, including flash, continuous lights, torches, moonlight, and even headlights from passing traffic. Each of these methods can be effective depending on the situation, as you can see from these images on screen. However, today, I'd like to concentrate on the two types I most often use. My favorite method of lighting is to gently light paint with torchlight. I like to use a soft edge and zoomable type, like this one here. When I show people my images, they immediately assume I'm using big and powerful lighting rigs to add the light. But as I'm about to show you, those big heavy lights are certainly not needed. When we shoot at night, generally we use large apertures, long shutter speeds and high ISOs, all which contribute to the amazing light gathering power of our camera sensor. So today I want to demonstrate some of my lighting techniques using a few of these nightscape images to give you some idea of how to use the different lights and how the various light sources impact on the final result of the images. The first shot I want to demonstrate is how I light this old truck here with the ambient night sky in the background and including the beautiful old gum tree which is hiding back there somewhere in the darkness. My method is simple, but there is quite a lot of thought that goes into the preparation of images such as these. Firstly, as with any shot, composition is key to obtaining a great image. I like to get down low to the ground to give the foreground a lot of impact. This also has the added benefit of lowering the horizon, which gives me plenty of sky. When taking night images, I tend to always set my initial exposure for the ambient night sky in the background. And from there, I'll add whatever light is necessary to brighten the foreground objects. So I start by taking a shot without any lighting at all, just to make sure I'm happy with the focus and composition. And from there, I'll add in the lighting elements to bring the image to life. I mentioned the old gum tree in the background. By placing a Z96 video light at the back of the tree, we get a lovely angle of light on the branches without blowing out any of the detail on the front of the tree. These constant video lights are really good for this type of lighting as they can be dimmed right down so they don't overexpose and overpower the scene. Also, this particular one has magnetic CTO gels which easily attach to the front of the panel. The video light is set to a very low level and placed on the ground facing up toward the tree. This is a bit of trial and error establishing the brightness level of these constant lights, but it's worth the extra time in setting up. So, when we see the result of the shot with the tree lit by the light panel, the result is a much more dynamic image. The final step is to light the actual truck in the front of the scene. To do this, I use my LED lens a P7.2 torch on a low level. The technique is quite simple, but as with anything, it takes practice to get the desired outcomes. One thing I always do is light from low angles, as this helps establish shadows in the scene. Remember that for an image to have impact, it needs to have light and shade, highlights and shadows. A lot of people assume that because we are shooting at night, our focus should always be on the starry night sky, but I think the foreground is equally important in creating awesome images. Having multiple points of interest, which are well lit and focused, is obviously more difficult to achieve than a single ambient exposure, but I think the results speak for themselves. To give another example of my lighting methods, I'd like to show you this lovely old harvester, which is sitting peacefully under the stars each night. I decided to take a star trail image with the harvester in the foreground, lit from side angles to best highlight the shape of the vehicle. My method for shooting star trails is to take a number of images at a medium duration rather than one long exposure as I can lower the ISO to keep the noise to a minimum. This particular shot has a total duration of 30 minutes and the 10 exposures were edited in Lightroom and blended in Photoshop. After I've taken the 10 background shots, I turn my attention to how I'm going to light the harvester. I'm always thinking of lighting angle and direction as this is what gives the character to the shot. I never light anything from the same direction as the camera. This means I'm always off to the left or right of the subject, which can sometimes be difficult when using ultra wide angle lenses as I don't want to get myself in the shot. One of my key ingredients when thinking about lighting is adding backlights wherever I can. 
As you can see, I've taken three separate shots, one from the right, one from the left, and another from the rear angle. This gives me plenty of options to play with when I get to the post-processing of my final image. So, as you can see, I've actually taken 13 images to create this final star trail. I won't go into the detail of the post-processing as that's not the purpose of this video, but it's a lot easier than you may think to blend these together. Our next image is something a little different, as it's a single image shooting with the Sigma 35mm f1.4 wide open. When you look at this image, you'll notice the out of focus stars in the background and how narrow the plane of focus actually is on the lantern itself. This is not such a common technique for nightscapes and certainly gives us a few challenges when attempting to light the scene. The reason is that to capture the stars, I still need a long shutter speed of 10 seconds with a high ISO of 2000. But because of the wide open aperture, any added light can very easily blow out the foreground object. For this shot, I couldn't use my standard LED lenser as it was way too bright. So I used this smaller light, which is quite handy for this type of work. As you can see here, I only exposed the shot for a split second to get the desired amount of light on the lantern. As with all light painting, it's trial and error to get it just right. Our final shot is something I'm sure a lot of people would find interesting. During a recent time-lapse shoot, I had to find a way of adding light to the foreground. You might wonder why this is a problem. Well, considering I had to take about 400 images to complete the time-lapse, and I wanted consistent lighting for the full duration of the sequence, yeah, that's a problem. For this particular shoot, I wanted to backlight the tree here with my LED light panel, which wasn't a problem as I can dim it right down to almost nothing and hide it behind the rocks. As you can see from the image on screen, all I had to do to create this single shot was gently light paint the foreground as I normally do. However, that's not practical when taking so many shots for the time-lapse sequence, so I had to come up with another solution. I tried putting another light panel on a stand here at the side at the front, but whatever I did, it was just too bright on the rocks at the front. Sometimes you have to get creative in situations like these, so I grabbed my Godox 300 LED panel and bounced the light from this old water tank back towards the scene. I needed the extra power and surface area of the 300 LEDs to get the right amount of light reflected off the tank. The other benefit of this lamp is that the colour temperature can be adjusted on the lamp itself. So even though the colour of the plastic of the tank was a bit off, it didn't matter in the long run. As you can see, the result is quite good and the bounce lighting method worked really well. So in summary, these are the lights I use for pretty much all of my nightscape images. I didn't show you this little Aperture brand panel, but it's so small and light it fits easily into the camera bag. It's dimmable and it packs a really bright light for its size. These four lights are all I need to do the job. The torches are best for fine art where you need to focus the light and paint onto your subject. They give a soft and shadowy light and due to the movement in the act of painting, the shadows blend into the background really well. The LED panels work extremely well as low level constant lighting usually for the full duration of the shot. It's vital that these can be dimmed to a very low level. Now you're probably wondering what I'm doing here with this time-lapse slider. Well, I want to leave you with a bit of a blooper. I was shooting a time-lapse here near this old tree and I'd carefully set up the LED panel to light the branches from the side. I'd worked out the details of how I wanted the camera to travel along the slider and off I went to do some other light painting shots in the distance. I'm not sure if the wind blew it over or what happened really, but when I returned, I found the LED panel on the ground and my scene in complete darkness. I quickly reset the light and let it continue to the end, but the result is what you can see here. It just goes to show that no matter how well we plan, there's always something that can put a spanner in the works. So, I bet you guys have never done anything as dumb as that. Never mind. So I hope this video has been a little bit helpful to you and I really look forward to seeing what you guys come up with when you next get out under the stars and take some awesome nightscape images. Okay, see you next time.